<laughs> black pen, red pen. Get out of here! It's pink pen, boys! In this video, I'll be introducing the Meyer Viatoris sequence. So this will assume, you know, what homology is on groups and on topological spaces. And it'll also assume, you know, what an exact sequence is. Uh, first of all, I'm going to remind you that the homology, the nth homology of a chain complex is equal to the kernel of del n divided by the image of del n plus 1, which I'll notate by zn over bn. And you'll also see of the chain complex. So zn is the kernel, bn is the image. Let's go ahead and state the theorem that I'll be proving. This is not Meyer Viatoris yet, but it's even more general. Let's say you're given a exact sequence from the trivial group into some group, I'll call it CN, into DN, into EN, into zero. And this is for all natural numbers N. And then we'll, we'll call these maps alpha N and beta N. So these are both group homomorphisms, and it's for every natural number n. Now note that alpha n is injective due to the fact that this is exact, and that beta n is surjective due to the fact that this is exact. And if you want me to quickly verify this, this is going to be sped up. The image of this first map is uh, just going to be the identity, which then has to be the curl of alpha n by the fact that it's exact. Well, curl of alpha n is just the identity that means alpha n is injective. And therefore, it's surjective. Those are just both the definitions. Now that I got that out of the way, what's the actual theorem? So given the fact that this is exact, we can construct a map delta star, which will take you from the nth homology of E, so of the E complex, down to the n minus one-th homology of the C complex, such that the following is exact. Let's go ahead and draw out what we know from the information. So we'll have delta star coming in to Hn of C. All right, that will be going via alpha star, the induced homomorphism for alpha n, into Hn of D. And then that will go via B star to Hn of E. And then from Hn of E, we can go down to Hn minus 1 of C. So delta star down to Hn minus 1 of C. And then we can go across via alpha star to Hn minus 1 of D, across via beta star to Hn minus 1 of E, and then we'll loop back around via delta star, and so on and so forth. How exactly do we approach proving this? So we should create a diagram to keep track of everything we need. All right, so let's keep track of the fact that these are exact. So these are exact sequences. So let's go ahead and draw out a couple rows of that. Let's start at n plus one, just so we can uh, have some room, and then We'll just go down in rows the different exact sequences. So these are all of the different exact sequences from n plus 1 to n minus 2 that were guaranteed by the hypothesis. Then what we can do is we can go down, so del n plus 1 via the boundary maps of the chain complexes of the so right there's del n plus one right here would be del n right here would be del n minus one so this is a huge diagram but it's going to be so essential so first of all we should probably figure out what this delta star is so remember it has to go from e to c of the lower 
So it should go from en to cn minus 1, in a way, except in the homology. So what we should start off with in defining del star is, well, first of all, we should pick an element, uh, which is going to be an equivalence class due to this quotient group definition. It's going to be a coset, and it's going to be an element of, well, should start off at hn of e. All right, specifically, let's pick a representative x that is going to be in the kernel. And so we'll pick one that's in the normal coset, kernel of del n. So we'll pick the one in the normal coset as a representative. The second thing we should do, well, we're starting here. How about we move back along beta n? So let's pick a y, an element of dn, such that beta n of y is x. So we're picking an element from here that once you map it via beta n into here, you get the original input. Now the reason why we can do this is because beta n, as I mentioned before, is surjective. And so there's always going to be a y in the input that would give x in the output. All right, so the third step, well now we're here, we need to get there. You can see there's sort of opposing arrows going in there. So what we can do is pick a z, which is an element of cn minus 1. This is where we're going to want to end up, such that, well, the morphism that can be applied on z is alpha n minus 1. I can apply that on z. And then right there is uh, del n. And I can apply that on y, because y is in dn, so such that that is equal to del n applied to y. Now, how do I know that I can do that? Well, let's do del n applied to beta n of y. Well, this is going to be del n applied to x. Ah, it's in the kernel, so it's 0. But what we can do is look at this diagram, because this diagram, and I forgot to mention this, commutes. This is a commutative diagram. All right, so let's look at where this is on the diagram. We have del n and we have beta n. So we're doing beta n and then we're applying del n to it. That's the same as doing del n here first and then doing beta n minus 1 there from the commutivity of that diagram. So we're going around this box right here, beta n, del n, same as del n, beta n, right here. All right? So that means that beta n minus 1, del n of y, is 0, which means that del n of y is an element of the kernel of beta n minus 1. Well, the kernel of beta n minus 1, by the fact it's exact, is an element of the image of alpha n minus 1. And that's very interesting, because that means there exists a z such that alpha n minus 1 of z is del n of y, which is what we needed right there. What you should also note is that this z is an element of the kernel of these boundary homomorphisms. So if I do uh, del, let's do del n minus 1 right here applied to alpha n minus 1 of z. But the commutivity of this diagram, alpha n minus 1, del n minus 1, I can do del n minus 1 first applied to z and then do alpha n minus 2. Now, what's the point of doing that? Well, remember, alpha n minus 1 applied to z is del n of y. So this is equal to del n minus 1 of del n of y. 
Oh, by the fact that these are boundary operators, they're idempotent in a sense, so that these go to zero. And look at that, alpha n minus two, del n minus one of z is zero. By the injectivity of alpha n minus one, we get del n minus one of z is zero. That means that it's in the kernel of del n minus one. So this, was just to show that we could make this delta star. All right, so we started off with x. We find an element that beta maps onto it. And then we find a z such that alpha applied to it is the same as the boundary applied to the element from last time. So this is the actual construction right here. The rest was just proving that it worked. All right, now that we proved that such a z can exist, and then it's also in the kernel of one of the boundary operators. What we'll say is that delta star of the class generated by x is the class generated by that z. Now you might wonder, what was the importance of it being in the kernel? Well, it's so that we know that these representatives line up in how they uh, are represented. So we, we know that these representatives both are in the kernel of del n. And so that makes it nicer to prove the following, which is that it's well-defined. Because technically, we don't know if I have an x prime, which represents the same class, so this is the same class, how do I know that then the output is the same? That's what I'm gonna prove now. And also note that I'm going to say y and y prime. So what does it mean for x prime to be equal to x? Well, that means that they are in the same coset of the image of del n plus one. So that means that there must be a u, which is an element of e n plus 1, so there's a u in here, such that when I do the image of it under the del operator, so del n plus 1 applied to u, I get their difference, so x prime minus x. So this means that they're in the same coset because they differ by an element of the quotient set. So right there's the condition for these two classes to be equal to each other. All right, what can we do with this information? What we can then do is look at this u in relation to beta. Because beta n plus one is again surjective. And so I can find a v, an element of dn plus one, such that beta n plus one applied to v is equal to u. All right, what can we do with that information then? Let's go ahead and do beta applied to y prime minus y minus del n plus one of, let's go ahead and do v. Because again, y and y prime from the second step are in del n. And so I need to do it on v in order to get the right image. So the image from here, so v is in dn plus one, the image under del n plus one is in dn, and that's the same as y prime and y, all right? What is this equal to? Well, I can do beta, and I can apply it to y prime minus y. And then off of that, I'll subtract, sorry, this is beta n, so this is beta n, because again, we're going from here, beta n, we'll bring it into there, All right? Then that'll go on to beta n applied to del n plus one of v, All right? This is then going to be equal to beta n, y prime minus y, okay? This right here, I can use the commutivity of this diagram again. 
So right here, we're doing del n plus 1 first, then beta n. I can switch that out using this box with beta n plus 1 first, and I'm applying that to v, and then doing del n plus 1. Del n plus 1 applied to that. All right, beta n plus 1 of v, by definition, is u, right? Okay, so we got del n plus 1 of u, beta n of y prime minus y. If I look at the definition of them, beta n applied to y is x. So that means beta n applied to y prime is going to be x prime. Beta n applied to y is going to be x. And this right here, I'm just going to keep it as del n plus 1 of u because x prime minus x is equal to del n plus 1 of u. So this right here is 0. What does this mean? Well, this means that y prime minus y minus del n plus 1 of v is an element of the kernel of beta n from definition. Now, what does that mean? Well, the kernel of beta n is the same as the image of alpha n. So that means there exists a t such that alpha of uh, alpha n of t is y prime minus y minus del n plus 1 of v. Now what I'll go ahead and do is do a little bit of diagram uh, work. So let's go ahead and look at where alpha n is. So alpha n is going into dn. I can then apply del n, all right? So I can do uh, alpha n first. Now what do I want to apply alpha n to? Well, obviously I'd want to apply it to t. And then I can do del n applied to that. So del n of alpha n of t. Well, then this is then del n of y prime minus y minus del n plus 1 of v. This is then del n y prime minus y minus del n composed del n plus 1 of v right there item potency that goes away so we're just left with that but from here and using commutivity i can flip them so uh i did alpha n then i did del n using this box i can do del n and then alpha n minus one so i do del n first so i apply that to t and then I do alpha n minus 1. What is this right here? This right here, let's look back to the definition. Right here, we can see del n of y is alpha n minus 1 of z. So this, by definition, is alpha n minus 1 of z prime minus z, straight from the definition. Oh, look at that. Alpha n minus 1 of whatever, alpha n minus 1 of whatever. Now I'm, I've, I've run out of room. I'm going to have to erase some of this stuff. Please, if you didn't already, take note of some of that. Now, by the injectivity of alpha uh, from before, we get del n of t is equal to z minus z prime, which means that z is equal to z prime in their classes straight from what i said before so there's no longer a question mark there they are equal to each other so that was just to prove that this all makes sense no matter what class representative you picked so although i picked the normal one from each of them which is just the one from the kernel uh you could you have to verify that that works for every other class representative. So both x and z were the kernel representatives, or what's known as the cycle representatives. And I just proved that it works for every single representative. All right, so this just proves that delta star is well-formed. It makes sense. Now, you also have to prove that it's a homomorphism. 
that is really like extremely easy that is the easiest part of this entire thing just use the fact that each of these individually are their own homomorphisms it comes straight from that the actual the hardest part about all of this is proving the exactness of this sequence I'll do it for one of them so I'll prove it for HN of D all right so I'll prove that the kernel of beta star is equal to the image of alpha star all right this is the only one I'm doing but please learn from what I did here and apply it to the other uh, points in that sequence to prove exactness so first of all what I'll prove is that the image of alpha star is equal to is a subset of the kernel of beta star so what we first acknowledge is that beta n composed alpha n is the identity is the trivial morphism this is from the exactness of this sequence and then the induced homomorphisms of beta star and alpha star will preserve this because the the induced homomorphisms is a functor uh, there is my video on functors if you don't know what they are so it should preserve that and that instantly proves it because if I apply something to this that will be an element of the image of alpha n the general element of the image of alpha n apply beta n to it it gets zero that's the kernel so the image is the kernel oh same thing here all right so that proves this uh, fact because the image if I apply anything to this one I get the general element of the image and then if I apply beta star to it I get zero which means it's in the kernel so every element of the image is an element of the kernel which means it's a subset all right this is the harder part the kernel of beta star is a subset of the image of alpha star what we'll do is we'll pick a class Z which is an element of the kernel of beta star clearly all right and we'll pick it so that its representative is in Zn of D so its representative is going to be the kernel of this boundary map so it's going to be in here it's the kernel from right here what if I do beta n of z well I picked it so that its representative is in the kernel of beta star so that means that it must be the image of del n plus 1 from right here it must be in the image of that uh, so it's del n plus 1 of u for some u an element of en plus 1 and then what we can do is by the surjectivity of beta n plus 1 we can find a v an element of d n plus 1 such that beta n plus 1 of v is u because u is in here beta n plus 1 is surjective all right what can we do with that information now well we can move this v then down back into dn so we can do del n plus 1 of v this will move us back down into dn and then because it's in dn what i can do is apply beta n to it except of course i don't want to just apply it to del n plus 1 what i should do is involve the z that i thought of originally so let's go ahead and do z minus del n plus 1 of v all right what is this going to be well beta n of z is del n plus 1 of u then minus well i get beta n of del n plus 1 of v using the commutivity of the diagram so here i'm doing del n plus 1 first and then beta n so i could also do beta n plus 1 first 
which I'm applying to V, and then do del n plus 1. All right, beta n plus 1 of V is U. So this right here is also del n plus 1 of U, which is then 0, which means that Z rem uh, minus del n plus 1 of V is an element of the kernel of beta n. And then kernel of beta n, use the exactness of this sequence to get that it's in the image of alpha n. Because it's in the image of alpha n, that means there exists a t, which is an element of c n, such that, well, alpha n of t is z minus del n plus 1 of v. We do the same thing we've done a thousand times. We apply the boundary operator to it. Right now we have alpha n of t, which is important, right there. And then we can apply del n to it, right there. So del n applied to that, which is then del n applied to z minus del n plus 1 of v, which is then del n of z minus del n, del n plus 1 of v. Well, you should notice del n of z, because z is in z n of d, that means it's in the kernel, which means del n of z is 0. And then right there is two ident uh, boundary operators applied to each other. It's 0 again. So we just get zero from that. Then right here, I can use the commutivity of the diagram. So right now I'm doing alpha n and then del n. What I could instead do is do del n first, and I'll apply that to t, and then do alpha n minus 1. Alpha n minus 1. So alpha n minus 1 applied to del n of t is 0. Which, because it's injective, that means del n of t is 0. What does that mean? Well, that means that t is in z n of c. So it's in the kernel of this boundary operator, clearly, from the definition. Then, if I do alpha star and I apply it to the class on t, Clearly, I'd get, because it's in here, it's the correct representative, so that if I apply it here, it's the standard representative that aligns with uh, Z, because Z is also in the kernel of the boundary operator. T is also in the kernel of the operator. And so I can just say that this is equal to the class generated by z uh, from right here. Right there, I can say it's the class generated by z minus del n plus 1 of v. And then what is that going to be? Well, it's in the well del n plus 1 of v, this class would make it so that that goes away. And so we just get the class generated by z. And so z is in the image of alpha star. So finale was that we started off with that. And then we got that the class generated by z is an element of the image beta star. Whew. Okay, I'm going to leave the rest of the exactness proofs up to you because that one by itself took a really long time. So now that we have that it's exact, that it's a homomorphism, that it's well defined, well, let me go ahead and actually show you the Meyer Viatora sequence. It's a corollary of this. It's going to be based off of the principle that we can split a topological space into the union of two other topological spaces. 
all right? And we don't even need it that their intersection is empty. In fact, it's usual that the intersection is non-empty, all right? What we can do is look at a few maps. Let's go ahead and draw a, a diagram of maps between these. So we'll have A intersect B, A, B, and X. All right, A intersect B, I'll do the inclusion continuous map between them because A intersect B is a subspace of A. So I can do the inclusion continuous map and then the inclusion continuous map here as well. Then between B and X, I can do the inclusion home, uh, the inclusion continuous map. I'll call it L. And the same thing between A and X. I'll call that one K. Now from here, I can produce a new diagram, which is on their corresponding chain complex instead. So CN of A intersect B, CN of A, CN of B, CN of X. All right, let's call it JN and IN. So this is for each natural number N. We'll generate the corresponding inclusion homomorphisms. And between CN of B and CN of X, we can do LN. And right there, we can do KN. Now from here, we can generate another diagram which is between their homology groups. So HN of the intersection, HN of A, HN of B, and HN of X. So let's induce the homomorphisms between these given these maps. So we'd have J star, I star, L star, K star. Now, how can I apply this theorem using these ideas? Well, we start off with zero, all right? This will go into what? Well, we should maybe start off with the cornerstone of this all, the smallest of these sets, which is the chain complex on A intersect B. So chain in, uh, in A intersect B. This is really where we start because we go out from here and eventually we can reach the chain complex on X. All right, now where can I go from here? Well, there's two maps going out from here. There's IN and JN. So how about we just apply both of them? IN and JN. So that's the map. Now there's two coordinates here. The first coordinate is CN of A. Second coordinate is CN of B. And then if we just direct sum it, uh, those two coordinates will make sense, and that will be a homomorphism. Now, where can this go? Well, both of these funnel in to the chain complex on X. So let's do CN of X. Now, what's the map going to be, to be between them? Well, we have these two maps. So how about we do KN minus LN? Specifically, the way I'm going to define this is an minus ln applied to the two coordinates x, y is going to be kn of x because it's coming from a and that's the first coordinate minus ln of y so that that will move over there and then from there I can go to zero that's the chain complex now how do I know that this is exact and this is the reason why I have a minus here, is so that it will be exact. Let's just very quickly prove that this is exact. The image of this will be CN of A intersect B, circle plus CN of A intersect B. That's the image for both of them. All right, what's the kernel here? Well, let's think about it. We need to have it that kn of, of x minus ln of y would have to be 0, which would mean kn of x is equal to ln 
of y. And remember, these are the inclusion homomorphisms, so we just have x is equal to y. But remember, the domains are different on these ones. So x is in cn of a, and y is in cn of b. And so the only way for them to agree is for them to be in cn of a intersect b. Both of them to be in this, this uh, specific group. So this is the kernel of this map, and it's the same as the image of the other map. It should be the diagonal set, where both of the coordinates are equal to each other, not just the direct sum. It is the subset of the direct sum where the two coordinates are equal to each other. And so that's pretty gosh darn beautiful. <laughs> Just prove that this sequence is exact. And so we can create the Meyer Viatoris sequence, which looks like this. Okay, so the first so the first homology group is going to be of A intersect B. And that goes via I star, J star, the induced homomorphism into, well that's going to be hn of a circle plus hn of b, which goes via k star minus l star, the induced, into hn of x. And then from hn of x, goes back to the beginning via delta star. And that'll continue. And right there is the Meyer Viator's sequence. And for cohomology, because the induced homomorphisms will all be backwards, the Meyer Viatoris sequence would actually just be in reverse. So it still holds true, it just it goes backwards. So you start with x, then you go to the sum, then you go to the intersection and then you loop back. And it's the same exact concept except with cohomology. All of this stuff still applies. The Meyer Viator sequence is essential for proving some homology calculations. It's essential for some homology calculations. It's one of the most important sequences there are for homology calculations. And because from what I just showed, it also works for cohomology. You get it that this is essential in any homology or cohomology calculation. So basically, you could use this to solve the Discord math competition problem. It's still open because the person who did solve it, they don't want the prize. So you can still go in and solve it using the Meyer Viator sequence. It's just, make sure you don't copy my solution, which I'll release soon. <sighs> anyway, that's it.